Hey guys, and welcome back to a new video. Today I will share 10 things with you that I would personally teach my younger self about development. And in these 10 things, I really mix anything that comes to my mind. So this could be more coding related, but could also be more personality, career growth related. So really just anything that I would personally teach my younger self in order to do well as a developer nowadays. Number one, requirements are not requirements. And this is really completely independent about what kind of requirements we talk about. So whether it's about requirements you need to fulfill in order to, to get a job and the job description, uh, whether that is requirements for a specific project you're working on as a freelancer, don't take these requirements as a kind of hard-coded. Job descriptions out there are usually very idealistic. So just describing the perfect type of candidate with the perfect skill set. But it's actually super rare that, that, that there is a candidate who has this exact profile described in the job description, who knows these exact same technologies, who's experienced with that, ideally also used these in the previous job. So it is absolutely fine if you read through job descriptions somewhere and you feel overwhelmed, you feel like, okay, you maybe only know 50, 60% of the technologies described there. Still apply to that job, you can still get it. If you don't apply to that job, you definitely won't get it. If you do apply, however, you, have a, you still have a chance to show off what you know. And in case there are no better candidates than you, then you will be the chosen one. So really don't let these unrealistic requirements for a job prevent you from applying there. Number two, nobody is waiting for you. Don't expect the market or companies to approach you. They are not waiting for you. It's you who has to show the market that you're worth hiring and not the other way around. And if you're currently not in the economical or career-related situation you want to be in, there's only one single person responsible for that, and that is you. And yes, that might sound hard, but the same way of thinking also comes with an upside. Whoever has the responsibility over your situation also automatically has the power to change that. And if you make the bad market responsible for your situation, well, you can only wait for it to become better. You are pretty much powerless in that situation. If you take over responsibility over your situation, however, it's suddenly only you who can also change that situation. Learning number three is perception matters much more than reality. There is a company called Liquid Death, which sells still water in cans for about $1.60 per can for, for half a liter of water. So they really just take normal water, fill it into a can, half a liter of can, they then sell for $1.60, which is way beyond the normal price of water. It's still water after all. And people still buy this. This works because people perceive this water as kind of superior to boring bottled water. Because when people buy something, they always buy the feeling and not the product. And the same thing applies to your career. If someone hires you, they buy the feeling of being right with their decision. So you don't really have to have the skills you think you have to have for the job. You just need to make people believe you are the best candidate for the job. And whether you are really the best candidate or not, Nobody will ever notice unless you totally mess up, of course. Number four, code reviews are not good at finding bugs, but they are amazing to teach you something. So if you're learning development, then it's very likely you make some sort of mistakes. Making mistakes is absolutely normal. I make them, you make them, we all make them. And learning from mistakes is also the best way to learn because this type of learning is always targeted at your current individual struggles, which is why they're your mistakes. But the thing is, if you don't know where your mistakes are, how do you want to learn from these? Learning from mistakes only works in two ways. Number one, these mistakes backfire in some sense at some time in future. So you make architectural mistakes in your code, for example, and at some point, the code base grows into a huge mess of spaghetti code. You need to restructure everything, invest lots and lots of time in order to fix that early architectural mistake. Or you are making a mistake that maybe makes you fail a coding interview because you did not know about doing it better before. Well then, at the time of failing the coding interview, you know that you made a mistake, but it's kinda too late because you already failed the interview. Option number two to learn from mistakes is just if you have someone who tells you that you made a mistake when you made a mistake. And doing this is so, so effective by our code reviews because a more experienced developer can look at your code line by line and give super detailed feedback at your individual current coding style. However, in order to find bugs, code reviews are typically not the ideal way because if you've ever reviewed some code uh, via a GitHub PR or so, then you know that as a reviewer, you often like a lot of context because you only see those lines that actually change without seeing the bigger picture of how, this new, how these new changes integrate into this code base. And this connection is important to also be able to spot bugs very easily. But that means if you want to learn development on the fast lane, then find someone who regularly reviews your code. And shameless self-promo at this point, that's exactly what we do in my 10-week Android mentorship program. 
Well, the next round starts in just one week when this video comes online. I'm looking for three more participants at this point, link below. So apply if that sounds good to you. Learning number five, don't take a senior as the single source of truth. Yes, if you are a junior developer and a senior developer tells you how to do things, then I would listen to them. Yes, that is true. But don't take this specific senior developer as the single source of truth. Don't take my channel and my advice as the single source of truth. But also don't do this for the senior developers in your company, for example. It happened so often to me that people came to me and asked me, hey, my senior developer told me uh, you can only use MVI pattern with use cases together. Otherwise, it's not MVI. There were people who told me that a senior developer told them that, which is simply wrong. So just because someone is a senior does not mean everything they say is correct. So just keep this in mind, listen to them, take their advice, but also look for advice at different places. Number thing that I would teach my younger self is best practices are really universal. When you learn development, then you hear all kinds of people come to you with, bro, it's a best practice. You need to abstract your code. You need use cases. You need dependency injection. You need this specific architectural pattern. And there's a reason why these things are often called best practices, but these best practices are rarely universal. They are rarely applicable in every single project. Because let's take the example of creating abstractions for your classes. That can make a lot of sense in order to be able to test your code better, in order to swap out certain parts of your code, certain implementation details much easier. But there are also scenarios where an additional abstraction does not bring you any of these benefits, but makes your code base more complex. And this shows that creating abstractions can be a best practice, but isn't always in any scenario. So my clear recommendation is, whenever someone tells you about something is a best practice, then instead of just taking this for granted and always using this best practice in any scenario, learn to understand why that is a best practice. Because if you understand the underlying reasons why something is a best practice, why something brings which specific advantages, then you will also be able to actually notice when these advantages don't apply and when this would not be a best practice therefore. Number seven, people online share the same views about 90% of the stuff and then bash their head about the remaining 10%. And I think this is actually a phenomenon that does not only apply to coding. But what I mean by that is that in the end, all kinds of people who argue online about specific best practices again, for example, but specific approaches to architecture, specific libraries that should be chosen, all those people in the end agree on a, on a foundation that makes up 90% of the whole thing. For example, that a good architecture for your code matters and also on what the underlying rules of a good architecture are. So modular design, separation of concerns, these essentials that every single architectural pattern is based on. But interestingly is then the details, the remaining 10% which these people debate about. So some people swear on using use cases, some people swear on leaving them away, some swear on MVVM, some on MVI. And this is usually then the main topic of the discussion, like, bro, you gotta use use cases. No, bro, that, that, that's actually not important at all. But both parties usually agree that a good architecture makes sense because this whole discussion is about architecture. And these differences on the final architecture, so the differences that these single decisions make, like use cases, yes or no, MVVM versus MVI, the differences these changes make are usually very negligible. However, still you often get the feeling that some approaches are way, way better than others just because some people are way, way more convinced about them. But in the end, everybody talks about the same things and wants the same things. So here, my clear learning from the last years again, focus on the underlying concepts behind all those specific pattern and best practices, libraries. So instead of focusing on learning retrofit for Android, for example, instead focus on HTTP, how communication works, what are REST APIs, what are the HTTP status codes, how does communication with the REST API even work, how is data exchanged? Because once you understand that, you can apply to any HTTP specific library, whether that's retrofit, Kator, or something else. And instead of focusing on always using MVVM because that's just the best design pattern, instead focus on the underlying concepts, modular design, separation of concerns, cohesion coupling. These are the underlying concepts that every single good architectural pattern is made of. And once you understand these essentials, you understand all the specific patterns as well. Number eight, focus on personality and not so much on hard skills. Yes, of course, hard skills are important. Of course, it's important that you have a good technical foundation, that you have good technical knowledge, ideally also good technical experience to do your work. But the thing is, in my experience, is that good soft skills make you way more unique as a developer than good hard skills. 
there are way less developers out there who are very good in soft skills, who have very good communication skills, who are very good at selling themselves, who are very good at, at reading other people. There are way fewer of these types of developers than there are developers who are really good at their hard skills. Of course, in a perfect world, you are good at both of these things. But in my experience, most developers focus way too little on the soft skill side. So how would I go about getting these soft skills, getting better at that? Well, what has helped for me is just reading books about personal development. In the first place, you need to understand that these soft skills are out there, that, that these matter not only for your career, but for your entire life. So read books about communication. That will not only help you to do better in your career, that will help you to do better in your relationship with your friends when being in an argument or so. Read books about selling yourself and then consequently apply those things in your career as well, of course. Just reading a book won't bring you anywhere, but it will equip you with the knowledge that you can apply in practice and this application will then really internalize this knowledge and also form your personality. Before you ask me about book recommendations, I don't and I can't give you any. I've read a lot, but the thing with books and book recommendations is always that just because a book was really helpful to one doesn't mean it's automatically helpful for another. Instead, what I would do is I would ask myself, what is the currently biggest struggle that I personally have with my personality? For example, I'm always very shy and I don't get out of myself. I maybe don't know how I would ask for a pay raise. I wouldn't know how I would approach such a discussion. Then I would look for books that solve specifically that issue, read these, and then really ruthlessly apply that in practice. Because without a really solid base of soft skills, you won't climb the ladder on your career. Coming to ruling number nine. Don't make your enjoyment depend on the act of writing code. And this is something that becomes more and more relevant. What do I mean with that? Well, the way we write code has changed a lot in the past years. So in the very early days of the first programming languages, every programming language was very low level. So people, I don't know, started with assembly, then C come together, where you still had to manually allocate and free memory. So it was a very low level way of coding. Then over time, more and more programming languages actually emerged. Nowadays, we have something like Python, where we have so many libraries and SDKs we can just include in our code. So we don't need to deal with these complexities behind this library on our own anymore. Instead, we can kind of train our own machine learning models there with just one file of code. And now I see the next step happening there. And that is the transition into the AI era. So while I'm convinced that AI won't fully take our jobs or our work or so, it will definitely become a very prominent companion in our day-to-day -day work. And I think AI is just the next level after this high-level code where we just had to write less code in order to abstract out all that low-level code. I think AI is now a way to having to write less of this high-level code that we nowadays consider high-level code. Because with AI, we can write entire files, entire classes automatically. We still need to wire these together somehow on our own. And we still need to tell AI what we want to build. But that is why I wouldn't make my enjoyment nowadays too much dependent on just typing code and solving these low-level issues because I have this very strong feeling that in future there, there won't be much space for that anymore, at least if you want to um, have a real career as a developer. If you just do it for a hobby, then do whatever you want. Instead, what I would really focus on is the enjoyment of solving real-world problems, of making other people's lives easier because this is the role where I think that will be the main thing developers will be responsible for, for taking all these real world requirements, packaging these into AI prompts, maybe writing a little, little bit of code on their own to just understand the whole thing that AI spits out. But AI will just be a companion, so you have to type less. And instead, developers will likely be reading more code, be restructuring code more. But in the end, we are still here for the same reason we are here for right now, to just solve real problems to build something that is useful for people. And this will remain. But focus on that if you want to keep your enjoyment as a developer. And lastly, number 10, exchange with others. You know, most people out there watch a video or course to learn new topics, but then don't use that knowledge. And unused knowledge will be considered unimportant from your brain and therefore forgotten over time. So it means, on the one hand, build projects with what you've learned. That's probably something you've heard quite often about. But what not so many people tell you is number two, to also talk about your learned concepts with others. Having discussions about those learnings you have from online courses, for example, really helps you to internalize these and just shows you different perspectives because your colleague might be like, oh, have you thought about doing it like this? And you know, I actually didn't think about that. 
And that's the moment where you learn something. So just intentionally enter discussions with people. Just go to your coding friends, to your colleagues, whatever, and say, hey, you know what? I've recently learned about this thing. Uh, this little part is not clear to me. Have you heard about that before? Then they maybe help you with something. Then they have a question. You can help them. And this dialogue, this really forms those neural connections in your brain to just be able to connect different topics you've learned from different videos and courses in order to just form something unique out of them. And that's, by the way, exactly what we've also structured the Mobile Dev Campus about. So that's a place on the one hand where you get coding challenges, you can practice with what you've learned, and on the other hand, a place to talk to others, to have real technical discussions that also help you to level up. Just like for the mentoring, I will also include a link to the campus down there. But now I would be curious about what your main learnings in the past years actually were as a developer. Let us know that down below. Let's have a little discussion in the comments so we can also learn from each other. And other than that, thanks so much for watching this video. I wish you an amazing rest of your week. Bye-bye.